and a published author with books and research articles on topics such as institutional racial diversity, racial identity, anti-Christian hostility, and culture. He holds a, ba a bachelor's in economics from West Texas State University, a master's of art also in uh, economics from the University of Texas at Austin, and a PhD in sociology also from the University of Texas at Austin. <laughs> Dr. Yancey is also a member of our American Solidarity Party Board of Advisors, and tonight he will be presenting on the topic of race and responsibility. Dr. Yancey, welcome. Thanks for having me. So Dr. Yancey, before we go any further, as a fan of college basketball, I do want to extend my congratulations to you for your Baylor Bears NCAA Tournament Championship this past spring. Well, thank you very much. You know, <laughs> been working on that jump shot for a long time, so glad to finally paid off. So I'm an Illini, so it's especially bittersweet uh, admission on my end uh, since we lost in the round of 32. But, but I'm glad you guys beat the Zags. Um, <laughs> and I'm sorry for any of our viewers who are uh, who, who went to Gonzaga, but, uh, but I, I am happy for that. <laughs> so Dr. Yancey, I understand that you have a new book coming out, which may be of interest to our viewers. Uh, it's called One Faith No Longer, The Transformation of Christianity in Red and Blue America. So why don't you tell us a little bit about this book? Yeah, uh, that book will be out probably in a couple of weeks. It, uh, it's, it's somewhat academic, but we try to write in an accessible manner. We compare conservative Christians to progressive Christians, and we, we define it theologically. And so our basic argument is that the way we, we think of Christianity really is, is turned into two different religions. That conservative Christians have a certain religion, and progressive Christians have a different religion. They use all the same terms, but the way they construct meaning is radically different. And so that's our basic argument in the book. And so how we get there, you can, you can buy the book and find out. But we use quantitative and qualitative research to, to come to those conclusions. Okay. Wow. Wow. Fascinating. So, so what's like one term that you would derive from there that's, uh, that maybe red and blue Christians think of differently? Excuse me. I, I didn't. Oh, so what's one common term that uh, red oh, Christians think Oh, I mean, like, one you know, just, 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 just think about, you know, the terms common to Christianity, you know, Jesus Christ, redemption, salvation. You know that that sort of stuff, but but the way that they're interpreted is a little bit different. Uh, okay. One thing that progressive Christians talk about is being Christ followers, okay. uh, and whereas uh, and they tend to see uh, see the Bible as the Word of God as almost idol worship. You know, uh, and so these are just some ways in which they have similar ideas, concepts, but the way they apply them is different. All right, fascinating. Well, I look forward to the new book. So I also understand that uh, another one of your books called So Many Christians, So Few Lions, mm -hmm. and that alludes to the ancient Roman gladiatorial uh, game. Right, where, yeah. Yeah, Christians were fed to the lions. Uh, yeah. So that explores the concept of Christianophobia. Yes. An anti-Christian sentiment in America today. So yes. Dr. Yancey, would you say that rising distrust in Christian institutions is also contributing to our racial conflicts today? And if so, how? Yeah, you know, I, I think we should think of the polarization in our society as multifaceted. Uh, you know, there may be, there may be, uh, you know, they, they definitely correlate with one another. So there's a political polarization and a racial polarization and religious polarization. And definitely there's correlations between people of certain, you know, religions, uh, political ideology, race, and that sort of, that sort of idea. And that way they, they, they feed each other and they reinforce one another. Now, of course, that's not to say that you know, all whites line up on one side, and all black, by the way, you know, things are not that simplistic. But there, but you know, there are allies that have developed on both sides of polarization, and we use our, our, you know, oftentimes we use our racial differences, our racial mistrust, to justify a polarization that's also based on on politics and on religion and, and on lifestyle and on things of this nature. Thanks, Dr. Yancey. So that actually segues us into our primary conversation topic for tonight. So I also understand you've written several other books on race and racial justice, including a book called Beyond Racial Gridlock, which advocates for a model of mutual responsibility to bring about true racial justice and racial reconciliation. So Dr. Yancey, can you tell us a bit about that book and how that fits into tonight's uh, presentation? Like as a society, why are we gridlocked on racial matters? And what does that mutual responsibility mean? Yeah, I actually wrote that book about 15, 20, 15, 16, 16 years ago, I believe, 16 years ago. 
And even at that time, I, I saw that there was this whole racial polarization where people were talking past each other and they were using certain models in order to try to answer the problems of race. And, and the models had strengths and weaknesses. And because people were so connected to their particular answer, you couldn't see the weaknesses, they could only see the strengths. Hmm. And my argument is that in dialogue, you're able to, you know, you can point out some of the shortcomings and we can find a better model together. I do have a book coming out in February called Beyond Racial Division, which builds on that because, you know, it's been 15, 16 years, builds on that, on, on the ideas from that book, uh, using more research, but also uh, making the argument that unless we have what I call collaborative conversations, we are doomed to, to talk past each other, to not find solutions and to be polarized and to sabotage each other in this racial dialogue. All right, thank you, Dr. Yancey. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Yancey has some prepared remarks entitled A Third Racial Path for a Third Party, uh, which was given <coughs> to our Washington State American Solidarity Party members earlier this week. And uh, which as Dr. Yancey had said earlier is, is based off his forthcoming book. Uh, so he'd like to share that with you now. So Dr. Yancey, uh, Yancey, whenever you're ready with that. Sure, let me go ahead and share screen. Uh, Mm. Okay, can everyone see a third racial path for a third party? Okay, now I'm gonna be honest, when I was developing this, this was 15, 16 years ago, I don't think American Solidarity Party exists, much less me knowing about, about them. So this was not because I was part of American Solidarity Party this path developed. But what I will say is I think that this is a path that fits in with the values that I hear in ASP. Now, to be sure, uh, if the Republican National Committee contacted me and said, look, you know, we want a different path, would you present this to us? Absolutely. If the Democrat National Com Committee came and said, look, you know, well, what we're doing is not working, can you give us some ideas? I'd be there in a second. Because I think this is something that's good for everybody, all right? But I think this fits better with the ideas of the American Solidarity Party. And therefore, I want, you know, for us to consider, is can, do we have to do what everyone else is doing? Or, or, or can we do something different? And something that I think has a better chance of working. Now, I'll talk why that is in a second. So third racial path for a third party uh, is what I want to call this particular talk. But once again, I will talk to anyone about this path. And I'm not limited to just third parties. But I do think this is something worth really considering. So... I will argue that both the Republicans and Democrats have distinctive ways of looking at race. And I will admit that not every single Republican looks at this as this exact way, but every single Democrat does. But the general, general trends are pretty there. And I think you'll see that once I start going into that. So let's talk about a Republican view about racism. According to Republicans, basically racism is something that's overt and went there from one individual to another. They buy into a perspective known as colorblindness. That the best way to deal with race is to ignore race. If I don't see your race, then I can't mistreat you because of your race, and there we can all get along together. Uh, and, and this comes out uh, when I talk to my conservative friends, when you listen to Republicans talk about racial issues, the notion that the best way to deal with racism is to ignore race. And by bringing attention to race, we create problems. Just as, you know, once one example of how this comes out, uh, a Republican study committee had this. As Republicans, we reject the racial essentialism that critical race theory teaches. We believe that individuals should be judged based on the content of their character, not their skin. And we believe that America's institutions should be colorblind, just as our constitution is colorblind. This is the same vision shared by the civil rights icon Martin Luther King Jr. Now, people argue that that's not exactly what Mark did. Forget about that for right now. We're looking at how they see the solution. And the way they see the solution is forget about skin color, be colorblind, our constitution is colorblind, let's reject you know, any, any attention to race. All right, so that's what I would argue is a Republican way of viewing race. Now, is colorblindness viable? Well, this is a viable view if we have a fairly fair racial society. In other words, 
if our society is fair on race, then it makes sense to be colorblind on race. Just as an example, and maybe I shouldn't use this example, but hair color, I have no hair, all right, it's fine. Our society, okay. I have no, yes. I have no hair either. <laughs> <laughs> We're brothers in that way. Uh, our society is basically fair on hair. I mean, and that's not to say that there's, you know, maybe people are attracted to blonde or redhead, but there's no research I know that says that we systematically uh, disadvantage people based on hair color. So to be hair colored blind makes sense. You know, we should not go out of our way to do anything about hair color because it's not something that we really judge. We don't have a history about it. You know, I'm not saying it's perfect. There's always a few blonde bigots out there if you want to put things about that way. They tell blonde jokes, who knows? Uh, but it's basically fair. That, that, that makes sense. If our society is basically fair on race, colorblindness makes sense. So that's the question. This is viable if our society is basically fair. Research suggests our society is not basically fair. I'll give you a few examples. Over the past 25 years, there's been no real decrease in racial discrimination in hiring. And the way we know this is by something called audit studies. And an audit study is when you take a, a white person and a person of color, black, Latino, and you, give, you make up resumes, and the only real difference is their race. And you give it to employers. Over the past 25 years, the percentage of racial discrimination that has occurred has not decreased. It's still, when whites apply for a job, they're more likely to be hired, they're more likely to get, to get the interview than with African Americans and Hispanic Americans are, are applying for a job. So that's obviously not fair. All, and this, remember, all the things are equal and your race matters. Another study, and there's other studies that, that show the same thing that driving while black is a real phenomenon. This particular study looked in Ohio and looked at four different areas in Ohio and looked at uh, African Americans being pulled over at higher rates than whites, uh, observed the speeds of blacks and whites and shown that blacks speed about the same rate that whites do. Uh, in other words, if you're an African American and you're driving, all the things being equal, you're more likely to be pulled over. And of course, this is tied into other research that looks at higher rates of incarceration, higher rates of conviction, higher rates of, of being charged for serious crimes, higher sentences uh, for African-Americans. So our criminology system is not fair. Resident segregation still impacts educational outcomes for people of color. What we do know is that because we're segregated, you know, where I'm from, where I'm living at right now, Dallas Fort Worth area, we're segregated. Uh, if you live in a city of any sort of size, you're it's segregated by race to some degree. And their educational outcomes, there's a black school, a Spanish school, and those schools don't perform as well. And so the kids who go to those schools don't perform as well. When I lived in Amarillo, I actually had, went to a Spanish school. Uh, the two white schools had great college trips. A preparation program. My school uh, prepared kids to, to build homes. We had a great industrial arts program. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. That's honest work. But who runs our society? Who go to college or people who build homes? We know the answer to that. So if you go to the school I went to, you, you are more likely to be groomed to be a bricklayer than to be a college professor. You know, Obviously, while well, it was important and impossible, I, I became a college professor, but that tells you that life is not fair. And then there's evidence of racism in our medical health care system. These individuals looked at 39 different studies. In 26 of them, they found evidence of racism in the beliefs, the practices, and when medicine was prescribed, procedures, what people believed about people of different races. So in multiple studies, we're finding racism in our healthcare system, which means that if you're a person of color, you can be treated differently in our healthcare system. Since our society is not fair, we need to be intentional in dealing with these racial problems. Colorblindness then is not viable. Okay, what about Democrat views about racism? 
Well, for Democrats, the, the tendency is to see racism as structural as well as individualistic. And social institutions can perpetuate racism even when individuals do not intend to be racist. One common term that we use today, and it's been many terms throughout the years, one common term we use today is anti-racism. And I, I, you know, I know there's a lot of controversy on critical race theory and such. I think anti-racism is a better thing to be, to be thinking about simply because anti-racism is what we actually do. Whereas CRT is a theory and, and some, you know, it proposes some things, but we have people who are doing anti-racism. So it helps us to understand a little bit better. Now, once again, just to uh, use one person who had an interesting quote, but there's several quotes I found. Uh, this was a, de a Democrat con uh, California legislator who said, we should be talking about mandatory training for anti-racism. We should put on a diversity and inclusion training for all county employees. <clears throat> now, I, just, I like this quote because I do think it, it represents an attitude among many Democrats, once again, not all, that we should be taking anti-racism training and sort of including, making people undergo it, because that's going to solve our racial problems. Now, to be clear, <clears throat> let me define anti-racism a little bit more so we understand it. Uh, and by the way, I got this from reading several anti-racism books over the past few months. So these are common themes that I saw in these books. And one is to be very proactive in our approach. If it's not allowable for you just to be non-racist and do nothing. You need to be doing something to deal with racism. And if you're not dealing with racism proactively, you're not anti-racist. The focus is on the unfair advantages or privileges of being white. So a lot of these books are actually, in a sense, written towards whites and what whites need to do because they have these, these advantages, these privileges and how they should be using them in order to create a, a more racially fair society. So I'm talking about implicit bias. Uh, they talk about hidden racism. That people, you ask them they're racist and they say they're not, and they actually believe it, they're not lying to you, but they have this implicit bias within them. And this implicit bias uh, comes, comes out and, and, and thus we have racism. Uh, even though they don't believe they're supposed to be racist. And th this is part of anti-racism. You know, we have to be constantly, especially whites, well, actually whites need to be constantly engaging in self-introspection about their own racism. Anti-racism about taking action to dismantle all aspects of racism. So it's not just the individual racism. It's not just the person who is personally racist. It's about racism in our structures, in our society, in our institutions. In fact, anti-racism is very, very proactive in trying to find how racism impacts people in our society, especially people of color. Another thing, uh, some anti-racists talk about ending whiteness. Now, some people misconstrue this as some sort of genocide, and it's not. Ending whiteness is not some sort of end white people. It's about ending whiteness. And the way whiteness is often defined, although this varies depending on who, you, who you're talking to, is the sort of culture, the norms embedded in European American society that serve to reinforce the advantages, those advantages, those privileges that European Americans have. So that's what we have to end. We have to, we have to look at aspects of European American culture that have been used then to, uh, to, to reinforce their advantages. And then there's an emphasis on listening to people of color for whites to listen to people of color rather than taking over. And indeed, what I would actually say is that in anti-racism, the role of whites is to serve people of color. And really, it's not much more than that. Now, how they serve people of color varies, once again, from author to author. And I'm open if someone can present someone who claims to be anti-racist, who says the role is not just to serve people of color, to enter into the conversation itself. But that's really not what anti-racism is about. So listen to people of color rather than, than attempting to take over in any sense. So that is anti-racism. And there's a lot of anti-racism training out there. Uh, you know, diversity training that's based on anti-racism attempts to, in, to implement anti-racism techniques into our social institutions, things of this nature. Now, question I ask though is, is 
is this approach successful? Because people have been doing things like this for quite a while. Does it work or does it not work? Well, one study shows that when we base remedies on just find the moving of resources from whites to non-whites, what we tend to produce is resistance. Now, this really should be a shock. If you're gonna come in and say, you know, our purpose is we're gonna take resources from this group into this group, this group is probably going to resist. And so what you have there is people who have an incentive to sabotage remedies that are based on moving resources from one group to another group. And this may be why some of these remedies don't work out so well. For example, diversity training has little long-term effect on prejudice. This is a meta-analysis, so it's not just any one study. It's a meta-analysis of, I forget how many, but I think dozens of different studies. And what they find is that you get a short-term boost, but not a long-term boost. So people may, in the short term, go, okay, I should do something about my prejudice, but they forget about, about six months later. <clears throat> this study shows that compelling whites to do anti-racism training. So if you require whites to do anti-racism training, that often can create a backlash can people of color. So tell them, once you're going to go to anti-racism training, you're going to learn about uh, white privilege or white fragility or, or being a coming anti-racist, becoming an ally. Instead of creating allies, what you often create is people who are, if anything, anti-allies, uh, who become more resistant to act to policies that would help people of color. And then this is the interesting study. It showed that if you teach people about privilege, you actually create less sympathy for whites, but you don't increase the sympathy for blacks. <clears throat> the thinking was that you teach whites about white privilege, they learn that blacks don't have white privilege, they become sympathetic to, to, towards blacks. This study showed that that's not what's happening. The sympathy towards blacks does not increase. Instead, what happens is they become less sympathetic towards whites, especially marginalized whites. So if you're poor and white, you are less sympathetic towards you as you're talking about privilege. So in, in a sense, teaching about privileges that whites have create less sympathy towards marginalized groups in general, uh, with the focus in on less sympathy towards marginalized whites. So there's really not good research. There's a couple of small studies that look at uh, certain professionals and say, hey, this may work to some degree. There's really not a lot of research showing that anti-racism has any sort of success. In fact, uh, in, in a few minutes, I'm going to contrast uh, solutions offered by anti-racists to solutions offered by what I'm going to propose and show you that uh, what I propose actually is much more effective. Okay, so both colorblindness and anti-racism fail. And I think they fail because of this. Because both of them attempt to make others capitulate to a predetermined solution. People with colorblinds will go and say, look, become colorblind, that's going to solve our problems about racism. People with anti-racism say, look, at that anti-racism, that's going to solve our problems about racism. You have a solution, you're telling people, you have to accept this. And I think that's why they fail. Because when you try to force people to, to capitulate, you get this resistance. And both of them do this to a certain degree. So what I offer is something that doesn't do that, what I call a collaborative conversations approach. Now this is built on my mutual responsibility approach from, from my earlier uh, book. And I use, I'm, I'm being a like collaborative conversations better because it's more explanatory. Uh, so let's look at what that is. <clears throat> Cloud conversations approach is working together to form healthy interracial communications that can solve racial problems. The idea is that we work together to form healthy interracial communications, not talking past each other, not seeking a monologue, but seeking a dialogue. And together, we work toward solving racial problems. Now, we do this through something called moral suasion. Now, let me talk about moral suasion for a little bit. Moral suasion is when we try to get people to uh, morally head in a certain direction. For example, if you have someone who is uh, cheating on his wife, you probably want to talk to that person about not cheating on his wife. If you have a kid who's, who's getting into drugs or smoking, you probably want to talk to your kid about not smoking. You want to convince them, convince them that that's the moral thing to do, to, to not cheat on your wife, to not smoke, uh, to not join uh, you know, some sort of weird uh, uh, 
oh, what's what, what's a QAnon type of cult? You know, it's moral suasion. And to do moral suasion, there are certain things that are important. For example, identify agreement. Research shows that when we got show when we agree where we can agree with someone, we're more likely to engage in moral suasion. Admit when others have a good point. To go, oh, okay, that's a good point. Uh, and just admit it. To build rapport. To to really work with someone so that so that they're connect that they feel connect to you, and to accurately understand the arguments of others. To understand where they're coming from, not to straw man it, not to create some sort of distorted version of it, but to understand their arguments. When you do that, you are engaged in moral suasion. And research shows that this more moral suasion is more effective uh, than other types of attempts to convince people to do a certain thing, something. Moral suasion is not some street preacher who's doing hellfire and damnation, you know. Moral switch is not a professor who's holding up your grade so you can agree with him or her. That's not moral suasion. Moral suasion is doing these sort of things. Are they for agreement? I mean, you know, a good point, rapport, understanding where we're coming from. Those other things are power. Now, we need power in our society and power is sometimes necessary, but carries your shortcomings, serious shortcomings. Let me, let me just, you know, if someone is robbing a bank, do I want the police officer to try and engage in moral suasion and build a rapport with that person, try to convince them to give the money back? No, I want the police officer to arrest that person. Uh, with my kids, I have a two year old, a four year old, and a six year old. Uh, so, you know, sometimes I have to use power. You have to say, you will clean up your room, uh, or, you know, there'll be, there'll be punishment. I have to use power sometimes. I have in the past, at least one time, I can remember clearly, used power to break up a fist fight. I got in the middle of two people who were fist fighting. That's power. I didn't decide I'm gonna build rapport with them or find what we have in common. I use power. There are times where power is necessary. But here, here's, here's the issue. When you use power, in order to keep getting, your, uh, getting the person to do what you want them to do, you gotta keep using power. If power is what you use and what you rely upon, then that's what you have to keep on using. And so what can happen is you begin to have to rely on power, which means you have to force people to do what you want them to do. And by power, power means a lot of different things. It could be physical power, it could be social power, cancel culture, it could be political power, it could be legal power. But the key is you have to keep using power. It's one of the reasons why once people start using power, they don't stop very readily when it comes to using power. Moral suasion, not power, is necessary to produce lasting change. Because when the power stops, you know, my boss gets me to come to work on time. If my boss says, I don't care, I may not come to work on time any longer. The power's only there. But the boss convinces me that it's the morally right thing to do. I'm paying this, this money. You should give me the, the hours that's due, and I can become convinced through moral suasion to, you know, I will report the boss. I, you know, we find areas of agreement. Yeah, you know, we really want to get this project done. Then I come to work on time, and it's a lasting change. The, the boss no longer needs the power. Moral suasion produces lasting change. Moral suasion, and here's where I think it really fits into ASB builds community, power builds compliance. The, the, think about the things I talked about as far as moral suasion. What does that do? A better rapport and find an agreement. That builds community. You know, that builds a community where we, we kind of find agreement, we move forward together. Power, we build compliance. We're going to pass this law, we're going to force you to comply. Now, you get compliance, but you don't get community. In fact, you get a lot in what happens in our society, which is polarization. When you rely on power to get what you want. And so, Cloud conversation is about using moral solutions instead of power. We try to enter into productive conversations so that we can engage in moral suasion, where we can enter into a give and take. And in doing so, we find a way forward. It's not about forcing, it's not about forcing people to agree with us, but working to, to earn their right so that they come to where we're at. And, and we also find ways we can agree with them. It's about learning what they need 
and trying to and trying to meet their needs while they try to meet our needs. The change, you know, this would change our society, our communities, our culture, our race relations completely. Now, that's all good. Do you have any research? You spent all this research looking at these other two, two ideas and said they were wrong. Do you have any research to support your perspective? Well, I'm glad you asked. What's the impact of work on healthy race relation, interracial relationships? Well, one thing we do know is that under the right conditions, interracial contact helps to eliminate bias. That under the right conditions, what happens is that we become less biased towards other people. Those conditions are things such as we feel equal to them, we have support from other authority figures, we're, we're collaborating together on a common problem. Under the right conditions, now under the wrong conditions, of course, it, it, can, make, it can make things worse. It can be combative. Under the right conditions though, it alleviates bias, alleviates our prejudice against other individuals. We also know that having a common group identity increases positive feelings. The more we feel like I can identify you, we are the, you know, we come from a same, similar group, similar ideas. The more we have that, the more positive feelings we have towards other individuals. So a common group identity increases our positive feelings towards others. Research shows that families with a collaborative orientation have more positive interactions and relations with each other. So families that are based on, we're going to have a goal-oriented orientation towards one another. We're gonna to work together and find common solutions and find compromises. They have positive interactions, as opposed to a family that's more power-driven, that's more competitive, where the goal is to sort of force members of your family to go the way that you want them to go. Uh, so collaborative orientation produces more positive interactions. Collab communication in an atmosphere of mutual support creates what we call volitional compliance. People voluntarily comply when we have this sort of mutual support built by cloud communication. When I feel like I have a say in the solution, I'm going to comply because I had a say and I have something in it for me. If the solution is forced upon me, you can use your power to force me to do this. I'm not some sort of superhero person. If the law says I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. I'm not going to volitionally want to do that. And if I can figure out some ways around it, I will. So cloud conversation communication really builds this atmosphere of, of volitional compliance. Now, <clears throat> as I promised you, there's, there's a study that actually compares what we would do with cloud conversation to what we do with anti-racism. And this is Dobbins and Calvich study. And it's very fascinating. What they did was they studied 829 mid-sized and large US firms. And so they were interested in whether or not these US firms were gonna become more diverse in their, in their managers, not the workers, the managers, because there's a lot of talk. Let's bring people of color in at the manager level. So they, they have power, so they, they have abilities to make decisions, so fine. So they documented efforts to increase minority representation among managers. So they wanted to know what companies are doing so that they would have more managers of color in the coming years. And then they want to look at the results five years later to see if there's a potential effect. So this is a really basic study. So you go, you, you look at the percentage of managers that are there, they're minorities. You look at what they're doing to try to increase that. Then you say goodbye. In five years, and you look at the percentage of managers that are in the company today. So here's what they found. They found that mandatory anti-racism training is correlated to a decreased representation. So if you mandated, you know, almost any type of diversity training, as including anti-racism training, what you had five years later was fewer managers of color in that company. If you tried to mandate most things, that was the result. One thing companies did was they mandated uh, job tests. That if you're going to hire, you have to force everyone to take a job test. And the idea was you can't hire your friends or the same race. Sounds great. Five years later, yeah, if you're a manager of color. But 
bringing white managers into a conversation for how you increase diversity led to more representation. So you took the white managers and said, okay, you're gonna head up the diversity task force. Your job is to increase our diversity. You're in charge of doing that. Five years later, you had more managers of color. You're gonna head up our recruiting efforts. Your job is to recruit more managers of color. Five years later, you had more, you had more managers of color. You're going to take it on, upon yourself to, to be a mentor to managers of color who are coming in. Five years later, you had more representation. So what was happening is that when you bring whites into the conversation, the pure results of diversity, of having more people of color who are managers increases. When you try to mandate certain ideas that these white managers have to follow, five years later, you have fewer managers of color. To me, that's, this is not their interpretation. My interpretation is when you employ anti-racism, it may, there may be, you may feel good about it. You may go, all right, yes, we're gonna mandate this, but the results you get actually is opposite of what you want. When you have a conversation, the results you get is what you want. You want more managers of color. So if I had more time, I'll go more to the nuts and bolts of how we do this. Uh, I just wanted to touch on uh, a few on steps of using the collaborative conversation approach. And I wanna make sure that this is not just about feel goodism. It's not just about that we walk off in the sunset together holding hands and, and are happy and everything like that. This is about getting real results, solving real problems. And so there are certain steps in which to take in, in, in solving those problems. And I wanna just outline what I see those steps are. So how would we solve racial problems? Those racial problems could be a variety of things. It could be uh, the relationship between the law enforcement and the community. It could be what sort of curriculum we're gonna to bring to our schools uh, as far as multicultural curriculum or, or how we're gonna teach history or literature of this nature. Uh, it could be how can we diversify our particular company, our particular social organization, our particular whatever we're looking at. You know, whatever, whatever the problems are, how can we use cloud conversation approach to, to get at those problems? And the first thing I'll suggest is define the racial problem. Don't try to solve everything. You know that if you get into a disagreement with your, with your spouse or significant other, you try to solve all the problems at once, you solve none of the problems. In fact, a strategy to use if you don't want to deal with the problem at hand is to go off and do another problem because then you jump around. Don't solve them all at once. Solve a specific problem. And when you deal with that problem, you'll be in a better position to deal with the next problem or a different problem. Define the racial problem. Identify the critical core. By that, identify what you have in common with the person that you're dialoguing with. Hopefully you have something in common. Maybe, maybe you have a common goal. Maybe you have some common values. Identify the critical core. What you have in common with the person you're dialoguing with. And then recognize the cultural and racial differences at play. Now to do this, you have to engage in, and once again, I don't have time to go into the details of this. You have to engage in active listening. You have to listen to understand where people are coming from rather than listen in order to engage into an argument. Active listening. You have to learn how to communicate. Communicate not to get a one-upmanship on someone that you're talking to. Communicate so that they can understand where you're coming from and why. So we can recognize these differences. Right, we have the critical core where we agree, but where do we disagree and why? What does this person want out of this disagreement? And then <clears throat> work at developing ideas that address the concerns of our racial outgroup. Our ideas will address our own concerns. They will. That's our human nature. What we have to work at is addressing the concerns of people we disagree with. Can we give up things that are not important to us to give them things that are vitally important to us? One, one uh, question I, I ask people is, you get 100% of what you want out of any situation. But 40% of the, your population is going to work against you. Is that what you want? Because that 40% one day may go to 45 or 50%, and then they're going to vote your, your programs out of office. Or what do you get 75 to 80% of what you want? 
And most likely the things you want the most. And give out say five to eight percent of the people working with you to implement that idea because they are getting what they want too. And since everyone has skin in the game, they're working to make sure this succeeds. What's a better approach? See, the first approach is unstable. People are going to sabotage you. They're going to go after you. The second approach is more stable, even though you don't get every single thing that you want. Love ideas that address the concerns of others. As a goodness of your heart, yes, but also very practical because you want the ideas going forward to be stable and for everyone to be pulling together. And that's work towards a solution to be accepted by all. And that should be a value. A value should be that our solutions are those that, now by all, do I mean every single person? No. There are people on the extremes who will never accept anything other than total capitulation by those who disagree with them. They're there. Sometimes, you know, there are family and friends and loved ones. We accept that their, their reality, but we can't let them hold us back. But there are solutions that a majority of people who disagree with you could accept, and then perhaps you could accept as well. Can we work towards finding those solutions? Can we work towards getting to, to those solutions, to getting towards a yes? This is a way in which we can use a collaborative conversation approach to move the ball forward rather than get stuck in the sort of cycle of protests and counter protests and, and angry and recrimination that our sick race relations is so troubled by today. So let's just talk about some implications of this approach. And then as time permits, uh, I'll, be, I'll be happy to take questions. Uh, first implication, and if this doesn't come through, I may be very clear about this. No one has all the right answers. And we'll get better answers by listening to others. Now, that does not mean that you don't believe you have the, all the right answers. Of course you do. I think I have answers. I think my answers are right. If I cease believing my answers are right, I will cease believing those answers. So by definition, of course, I believe that I have the right answers. Well, that, that, that's not what I'm saying, that, that you don't believe that. But in the scheme of things, we all have blind spots. And I have to recognize my blind spots so I recognize that I don't always have the right answers. If I listen to others, I get better answers. And even if, my, if I don't go completely off my answer, I still basically believe in it, I can find ways to make it better, make it stronger. Working together, this community, is parts that get better answers. We need intentional efforts at collaborative conversations. This does not happen just willy-nilly. It does not happen by accident. It happens when we intentionally move forward to find these collaborative conversations. Our society, we talk past each other. We're looking for weaknesses. We're looking to go, aha, gotcha moments, rather than conversations where you really try to understand where people are coming from, why they feel that way, and can we find solutions that meet their needs as well as our own? It's intentional. It means that everyone must be respected. We cannot move forward if we decide, well, they're not important. Their needs are not important. We gotta bring people in. We gotta get buy-in from as many people as possible. Once again, everyone can be every single person, but we gotta get buy-in. And to do that, we have to respect their needs, their concerns. The skills of active listening and productive Communication is value. Once again, I didn't have time to really go into that. Uh, when I do my research, sometimes I have to engage in active listening because I'm I'm listening to respondents and I'm trying to listen to so I capture what they really mean, what they really value. Those are skills that we need to develop. And it's not lost on me that we can apply this to our race relations, we can apply this in other areas of our life. And one of the things I'm convicted about, you know, and this is a do as I say, not as I do moment is I don't always do a good job my social media, my day-to-day -day life of active listening and, and paying attention to the needs of others. It's something we can work on. Work is for solutions that are win-win to the win-lose. We need to move away from win-lose solutions, trying to beat the other group down in win-win solutions. When they win and we win, we all win. And that's the attitude we need to develop. And so I'm asking for an attitude change in our society. It's not gonna come overnight. And it's not going to be easy. 
I believe it's the direction we have to go unless we want, unless we are, if you're satisfied with the race relations today, then we don't have to go there. But if you're not, and I don't care whether you're colorblind or anti-racism, what we've been doing has not been working. And we need to do something else. And maybe trying to look at win-win solutions is what we need to do. So let me uh, take us out of the, uh, out of the uh, shirt part. Sorry. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Yancey, for your there presentation. Okay. Yeah. And now I'll open up with questions. Yeah, we, we certainly appreciate that. And for folks who, uh, who are listening to this uh, presentation, if you type in your, your questions to, into the chat below, I'll be able to see them and be able to, to ask them to, to Dr. Yancey for, for a response. But while we wait for these uh, uh, questions to be asked, so Dr. Yancey, so one thing that, you know, I think that this uh, idea about collaborative conversations is so very timely for us especially to us as a political party, because uh, as delegates, uh, we're in closed room uh, sessions talking about things like party think tanks and about uh, how we can build policy solutions to the various problems within our society today. Uh, so problems you know, such as you know, racial, uh, racial injustices, public safety, and, uh, and, and conflicts between different communities. So uh, if you take myself, for example, so as an Asian American, I'm aware that there are there's a segment of Asian Americans or Asian immigrants who are very anti-affirmative uh, action in elites or higher education. Uh, they actively campaign against uh, continued affirmative action uh, uh, policy because their their children are not being served by them. But um, you know, according to to this model, you, know, you see that that there there really isn't much of a relationship uh, between the two groups, right? Uh, and you're not seeing the the other side of the story, you know, if you're only thinking about your, your children. Uh, and uh, I think that, you know, having uh, stakeholders at the table is, is so very important. So thank you so much for, for bringing uh, that to us. Uh, we do have one question from the audience. Uh, so uh, Kent asks, so what are your thoughts on critical race theory and the 1619 project in the school curriculum? Okay. Yeah, the critical race theory question comes up quite often. Uh, let me just first say I'm not an expert on critical race theory. I've read a little bit about it, you know, in, in grad school. And of course, with all the critical race theory, I've heard a little bit more about it. <clears throat> I had a, a philosophy professor tell me, you know, you should think of critical race theory in three ways. There's what I would call a minimalist definition, which is really about legal theory. Uh, and and, and in its pure sense, it's about legal theory that was developed in about 1980s, 90s, that sort of thing. There's the derivatives of it, which I would say is more like an anti-racism. And you could, even though it's not argued in critical race theory, there are certain ideas that when you take them to, to a, a conclusion, it leads to some of the anti-racism ideas. And then there's just what public think is, the public thinks of what critical race theory is, which is, which I think is whatever you don't like about uh, race relations, you put it, you say you call it critical race theory, you say that's evil. Uh, the, th the third one, you know, obviously not very accurate. Uh, so we're really looking look at the first two. Uh, I'm, I would not, I definitely would not call myself a critical race theorist. I think that there are some issues, especially the way that some of the derivatives do largely follow out of some of the ideas of critical race theory, such as the prioritizing of people of color voices quickly turns into shutting down the white voices. Uh, and so, you know, but I do think that is not this, this monster that people make it out to be. As concerns the 1619 project, I'm not a historian, but from what I've read, that there are uh, there are some severe mistakes, historical mistakes in the 1619 project. And I think the reason why the mistakes developed is there was a focus and an understandable focus on let's make sure that when we tell our history, we tell the whole history. We tell the history of you know how, you know what happened to African Americans and things of this nature, and of slavery and of, and of Jim Crowism and that sort of thing, which is, which is, I'm down with that. But there's a danger that that's all you tell. Uh, and I think probably what happened was it became out of balance. So, and, and this happens, you know, you, you're, you become unbalanced one way and so you become unbalanced another way and the truth is somewhere in the middle. So I would not advocate, from what I've read about, I'm gonna advocate 1619 Project as a, um, as a academic piece to study, but maybe a, a study of you know, a, a, a different way of looking at history, you know, in and of itself understanding this is, you know, its own way of looking at history. 
Uh, and then you bring in some other things and then you sort of get to the middle. That's probably where I would go on that sort of thing. Even though I'm not a historian, but I trust some historians who, who tell me that uh, some of the things that they that in the 1619 project simply is not accurate. All right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Yancey. Are there any other questions uh, from our audience? All right, so here's, here's one from an anonymous attendee. So should reparations include uh, ethnic Catholic communities, which are historically yellow lined by insurance and banking industries and the federal government? Okay, reparation question. Up until about 15 minutes ago, I thought reparations is a mistake because all you're gonna do is create a lot of resentment. But really in this model, reparations make sense if it's fairly negotiated. So the answer to the question is not for me to say yes or no. The answer is in our, in our dialogue, you know, I think it's very fair for a, a white ethnic Catholic to bring, bring into the discussion, look, you know, these things happen to my community. And so if we're talking about reparations, what are we, what are we gonna do about this? That's a fair dialogue. What's the answer? I think the answer is gonna come out in our dialogue with one another as we engage in moral solutions with one another. And, and, and you know, there are things, you know, I know something about anti-Catholicism, but I'm, you know, I know about the know nothings and some of the other things that have happened, but there's, there's much I can learn. And perhaps I've learned someone else, I would say, okay, and we do reparations, maybe we, we need to look at this dynamic of it and we need to incorporate that somehow into it. But I can't say that today because we've not had that sort of dialogue. So we, this is a good example of why we have to find solutions by entering a dialogue rather than saying, this is my solution. Now my goal is to get you, force you to accept a solution. My goal is to figure out where you're coming from, you figure out where I'm coming from, where can we find commonalities and how can we iron out the differences? Thank you, Dr. Yancey. This next question is from Mr. Uh, Merhawi Tesfai. Uh, so if reparations cannot be paid in cash, uh, what do you suggest that we do? I, you know, I go back to what I said before. That's, that's something we have to dialogue about to, to, to figure that out. And, may, and, and you know, we, could, we might become creative. We might become creative and say, okay, you know, financially, reparations, if we really did, would break the country. And we, we literally cannot do that. There may be other ways that, that, you know, it could, and once again, I'm not saying this is the answer. The answer comes in, in dialogue. The answer could be in, uh, in uh, college scholarships. The answer could be in, uh, in fund funding for businesses. The answer could be in, in uh, building up communities of color, the infrastructure, uh, the educational system. You know, there, there could be other ways in which it could come out. Uh, and that's what we need to talk about. So part of what I think would happen in this is we would learn how to become creative. You know, we would say, we, we would give our idealistic thing, reality would slam into that, and then we find creative ways in order to work with that. I think that's what would happen. Right, and I, I think to the, to the question, I, I, would, I would challenge them with this also. So uh, because um, we are talking about this as academics and, and as uh, commenters from afar, it's difficult for us to be wholly prescriptive. On these issues so we have to uh provide ideas and try to encourage people to have those good faith conversations good faith collaborative conversations yeah. to to create their own solutions on a case-by-case -case basis so I, I think that 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 does strike at the heart of a lot of what dr yancy is talking about all right so we do have a couple minutes left and two questions are uh on the board so one from mr john montgomery uh john asks i'm not sure if you know about the negotiations behind the utah compromise if you do know about it, would you consider it to be an example of collaborative conversation? You know, I don't know a lot about it. I know just the general outlines of it. It seems that it has been, you know, just from my, my basis, I, it's not an issue that I've really dived a lot into. So it seems that, that that's kind of what, what did happen, which if so, you know, perhaps I should use that as a case study. I mean, that may be a great research project. Are you trying to do more work? Uh, but yeah, I, I think that, that that is interesting. It'll be interesting to see what happens long term with that. All right, thank you, Dr. Yancey. So we do have one more question from Kent. Uh, Kent asks, so what are your thoughts on Colin Kaepernick kneeling as unpatriotic and the 1776 commission as what appears to be forced nationalism? Do you think BLM has done more harm than good since George Floyd or the opposite? Okay, that's a lot of questions all at once. Uh, 
Let me start with the last one first. Uh, I think the approach of BM, BLM is, is you know, akin to anti-racism. And so probably my critiques of anti-racism would apply to BL, BLM. And my fear of BLM is not that they are they're wrong. It's just that I know from, from research and from life that when you try to force people to do something, they resist it. Uh, and so I don't think that you're gonna get the outcomes you want from that. So, so yeah, that, that'd be my approach. Uh, the 1776 project, I don't know enough to talk about white nationalism with that. I, I'm careful about throwing around terms such as white nationalism. So I really would have to read more about it. You know, if it's, you know, if it's, uh, and I would want to know what historians say about it too. You know, uh, is, is this a distortion uh, and who's behind it and, and that sort of thing? And, and uh, so I, I really couldn't give you a really good answer on that. So just to take it, you know, I don't like to comment on things I don't know that much about because I, you know, I, I just feel that I'm not a pundit, I'm an academic. Uh, and pundits do that and, and they get in all sorts of trouble. And the last one was kneeling, yes. Uh, you know, I don't have strong feelings about Kaepernick kneeling or not, I, I really don't. Uh, you know, is, uh, is it patriotic or not? Yeah, sure, uh, but it's it's really not a, a, a huge uh, thing about thing. My, now, where I find Kaepernick interesting is he's he's an interesting. Uh, uh, I you know I I I'll, I'll, I'll do a survey and I'll ask someone uh, how they feel about Kaepernick. I can use use that as far as a parameter, as far as race relations to, to a certain degree. Uh, I you know I, I guess. Uh, there's 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 multiple issues in there as far as Kaepernick and not being in the NFL any longer and, and that sort of thing, uh, but uh, but yeah, I, I think he I think he he sort of becomes symbolic for people who don't like him. Uh, he becomes symbolic of something not to like about other aspects of race relations. People who do like him, he becomes symbolic. I think that's kind of the key on Kaepernick. Kaepernick. Right. Well, thank you, Dr. Yancey. We are out of time, unfortunately. Uh, so again, thank you so much for speaking with us this evening. It was a privilege to hear you speak at our, at our virtual, virtual convention tonight. Uh, so for folks uh, who are online viewing, uh, we're now going to be transitioning our time over uh, to the panel discussion on faith and politics, uh, hosted by Amar Patel, and uh, you, you can enjoy that next. So thank you again.